thanks for your attendance, everyone, and thanks for um, the presenters for presenting at this uh, conference. Um, so we'll just have the presenters go first and then discuss and at the end, just to make sure the presenters have as much time as they can in case there's any tech issues. So each presenter I'll give about 17 minutes and I'll try to give you a warning if it seems uh, you're getting close to that mark. Um, so I'll be clicking through the slides. So just tell me uh, when to hit next slide. So first up, we have Christina Bishop, a PhD candidate at Southern Methodist University, um, and she will talk about her work. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. This is my job market paper called Resilience and Recovery, Household Income Dynamics in the Survey of Income and Program Participation. Next slide. Income inequality is an economic concern, and it may depend on such factors as a distribution and effect of income shocks. In particular, the effect of shocks is real because the income loss may be difficult to offset. If someone has an income loss in the first period, then they may grow behind as, in, as time goes on. And so then it the, can create an even longer quality recovery, which can widen the income gap and exaggerate the gap. Next slide. In terms of policy, Policymakers may want to know how they can more effectively design policy to aid recovery after an income shock. And some questions they can ask are first, who recovers slower? How long does it take for them to recover? How much income to give? And is giving income the right policy? Next slide. The research questions of this project are first, how long does it take for households to return to their pre-shock level of income? And second, what characteristics are common of households who recover quickly from income shocks? Next slide. The contribution of this paper is that I provide an empirical model to estimate the speed of recovery of shocks. And this is valuable because this model can be applied to other settings to know how long it will take for households to recover from shocks of various types. I provide a general model. Then I also assess the heterogeneity and recovery time across household types. And finally, I account for measurement error in self-reported income following the methods of Lee et al. 2009 who used consumption. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so I will be using the survey of Income and Program Participation, the SIP. It's a multi-stage stratified sample of the U.S. population with rotating panels. And then I will explore changes across the economic environments by using two waves of the SIP, the 2004 and the 2008 cohort, so that I can compare how a recession in the time before a recession may impact recovery times. Next slide. The sample that I use are household heads between ages of 25 and 55 to focus on those in the labor force. And then I also look at those who are not full enrolled in school full time or on active military duty. And then I also aggregate the data every four months to account for seam bias where the in information a participant gives right before and right after the, inter the interview may differ more than is expected. Next slide. The variables that I use are the total real household income is my main variable. This has been after top coding. And then I use a time varying covariate of household size. And then I'll look at different demographic characteristics such as race, education, marital status, and metro status. Next slide. So how will I do this? The, uh, first, I will model the income process and I'll account for measurement error. Measurement error has been a problem and it's important to account for it. Then I will si simulate corrected income values free of measurement error. And then from those, I introduce a shock in the initial period and, and see how long it takes for households to recover in different types of households and different economic environments. Next slide. So this is my income process that I use. It's a 
dynamic AR1 process. I model the true income as a function of lagged income. I have a household fixed effect. I have a household size, a household specific time trend. And then that all that household specific time trend includes a time varying shock and an average time effect. And then of course I have a random shock in my model. Next slide. So measurement error is data that's been me measured imprecisely. It can occur for a variety of reasons, such as poor recall, uh, purposeful misinformation, or survey method. Income has also been shown to contain non-classical measurement error, and so I feel that's important to account for it here. And this measurement error has also been shown to be mean reverting and serially correlated in the case of income, which I'm using here. Next slide. I model measurement error linearly where the observed income I see from the SIP is a function of the true unobserved income and both the time invariant component and a time varying component. This time invariant component may be correlated with the household fixed effect. Next slide. This, now to estimate the model, I take the measurement error and substitute into the income process to get obs the observed total household income. And then I first difference the model by taking out the lagged income. And then I estimate the model in first differences using a two-step generalized method of moments and the instruments are from Ariano and Bond. Next slide. So after generalized method of moments, I can get coefficient estimates for gamma, the persistence of income, beta, the household uh, effect, and then dt is the household uh, time trend. And then the estimated residuals are in first differences, and I form take the product to form moment conditions, and they allow me to estimate the variance of the time varying measurement error v, the time time trend u and the random error epsilon next slide so then i simulate the true income path these uh, income instances are what i get from the parameters and randomly simulated error terms from normal distribution and then i need income and levels but the first two incomes uh, require initial a linear pro projection, and that comes uh, from a regression on the first values, and then if you can just scroll down a little. So I have uh, estimating equation errors, and then these give me, the those residuals give me variances for what I call the projection errors, and these all fall through except for this uh, one, the sigma squared two has a the variance for the time invariant measurement error, which is not identified. So I provide bounds on this projection error. Next slide. So I have an upper bound when I set the time invariant measurement error to zero, and then the lower bound comes from the variance matrix that must of all the simulated errors must be positive semi definite. And then for the observed income, I assume that both the time invariant measurement error and the time varying measurement error are zero. So these will provide bounds for my estimate of different types of measurement error. Next slide. So then after I have these corrected income paths, I simulate, uh, I simulate them using the parameter and variance distributions. Then I introduce a in negative income shock at time period two. And I trace out the income path using all the same shocks as in the case without the shock. And then I define the recovery time as how long it takes for the household to return to their initial level of income after time period two. And then I repeat the plot process by splitting the sample by demographic characteristics. And finally, I compare the estimates across different data periods. Next slide. So this is an example of just one household and in just one replication, I do this for many households and many replications and notice that this household, after they receive the, sh the shock is 
uh, has a, a worse uh, income. And then this, with their shocks, they actually don't return to their initial value of income. So this is an example of one household and one replication that doesn't recover. Next slide. Now, this are just some summary statistics of over the income period, I have the total real income at the 25th and 75th quantile of the distribution at by measurement error type across the sample waves. And you can see that over this sample period, the income is, is declining during this recession period. Next slide. And then I introduce a shock as a 10% or a 25% shock. And then I categorize by measurement error type. And this shows that about 60% of the sample recovers and about 40% doesn't. So it does depend on the measurement error type. And as we'd expect, fewer households recover from the 25% shock than the 10% shock. And um, I, in the subsequent uh, graphs going forward, I'll show the ta uh, table of those who recover and the graph of only those who recover, just to keep things clean and simple. Next slide. So this is the recovery speeds of measure by measurement error type, and this is really cool because we can see how long it takes for households to recover after an income shock, and this is by measurement error type. So I see that the observed income is bounded between the two measurement error types, and when I have the upper bound of measure of the projection error they actually households on average recover faster because for any given recovery period they have a higher cumulative probability these are the um, empirical cumulative distribution functions next slide then i also look at the economic environment so i compare the 2004 and 2008 waves of the sip and it it doesn't look too different but i do see that uh there's a higher percentage of people who have a shorter recovery period and then 2008 data, but then as the recovery periods go, can be longer, the 2008 has a um, lower probability. Next slide. I also calculate the half-life recovery, so I look at how long does it take for them to recover to half of the income before the shock. and. These are also pretty, um, this is what we would expect as well. Next slide. And then I can calculate the recovered income. So an alternative definition of recovery, and I look at the percentage of income each household has by the final period, where the values of greater than one represent a complete recovery. I've also taken these final period as a present discounted value of income. And uh, what I find is the mean percentage of income recovered is about 80%. Next slide. And then I calculate the income loss. The first graph on the left is for each household. What is their average income loss? And then this is on a 10% shock with the upper bound of the projection error. And then I also on the right graph, look at summing across households, what is the average log income from the, from the shock. <clears throat> Next slide. And then now I break into different household types. So looking by race, I find that about 70% of black household heads recover and about 55% of white household heads recover. Next slide. But of those who recover, I find that whites actually recover faster than blacks. You can see that their distribution is um, stochastic. Uh, the black distribution stochastically dominates. Next slide. And then by education, these are both pretty similar between college and high school, about 56 and 58% that recover. Next slide. 
And of those who recover, I find that household heads with a high school education recover faster than the college educated. Next slide. And then by marital status, I find that um, these are also pretty similar between married and single household heads, 55 and 57 percent. Next slide. And by of those who recover, I find that uh, married household heads recover faster than single household heads. And these are graphed on the entire distribution of all households and all replications, just so you're aware. And then next slide. By metro, actually non-metro have the highest proportion of recovery. They recover about 83%. Next slide. Um, and then of those who recover, the non-metro recover slower than the metro group. Next slide. And then I do a decomposition uh, to explain what happens with these group differences. So it can happen through the parameters and the income persistence variable, the random errors, or the observable characteristics. Next slide. So basically what I do here is I take for each uh, parameter, I, I use only that, I use the group of the other one. So for example, I take the white group and then I use the parameters of the black group and see, or the random errors, et cetera, and see how much um, different their recovery times and proportions are. And what I can, um, and looking to see how much different they are than one. So for example, in the recovery time, I see that using the random error, they have a much higher uh, recovery time, 1.37, than the other groups. And then uh, scroll down to proportion. So by race, um, the one that matters most is uh, the most different than one is uh, the time trend. And so this uh, allows me to see which. Uh, Overall, the time trend and the random error show the biggest differences in the recovery times and proportions by demographic group. Next slide. Okay. In conclusion, I find that the measurement error uh, bounds the observed income, and we see longer. The shock size definitely has an cap, uh, but the economic environment is uh, pretty similar. Next slide. And we found the whites recover faster than black household in college and married household heads faster than single metro area faster than non metro area. So more could obviously be done here to more dig more into these differences than what I've done to simply decompose them. Next slide. Future work, I'd like to connect this work on income resiliency to my other work on intergenerational and show how families pass down income resiliency and di dive more into the heterogeneity results, also include a non-linear model for income. And final slide, next slide. In conclusion, this models the income shock recovery speed, uh, has an income dynamics with measurement error and policy relevant characteristics for heterogeneity and recovery speed. Okay, next slide. Thank you everyone for your participation. All right, thank you, uh, Christina. All right, so next, let me uh, get to the PDF slides. And up next, we have Professor Michael Carr at UMass uh, Boston presenting his uh, work. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so, uh, in some sense, this is actually pretty closely related to what Christina just presented, just with like a lot less math. Um, so we're interested in measuring uh, short term instability um, in theory, but you'll see why I say in theory. Uh, go ahead, Jonathan. Next slide. Oh, okay, so um, we set out to investigate how measuring uh, earning stability at um, higher frequencies than has been done in the past um, varies by race and what role do job transitions play in these differences? So there's a big literature in economics on earnings instability in general. It's divided into two basic categories, 
One uses a measure called volatility, which is what we're going to use, and I'll define it in a second. And the other uses a more formal modeling strategy that ties that tries to separate permanent income shocks from um, transitory income shocks. And overwhelmingly, this literature looks at annual earnings changes where it, it's specifically calendar year earnings. Um, and to the extent that periods of, of non-employment are considered, they us it usually only considers periods where you have an entire year of zero earnings. So what we wanted to do um, is try and look at higher frequency earnings changes and try and separate, um, get a better measure of periods of non-employment by looking at higher frequency job transitions. So basically within year periods of employment changes, right? Uh, next slide. Um, now this uh, being the SIP, I, um, once we started doing this, uh, we started to run into some issues that were a bit um, unanticipated. So this led to some additional research questions. The first one is the is sort of the meta question, which is whether we can even use monthly changes um, in the redesigned SIP. So we're going to start in the 2014 panel and go forward. Um, and specifically for us, the questions would be, is what we see in monthly volatility correct? Um, and is the number of job transitions that we see from month to month correct? Those would be the two critical questions that we have to answer if we want to use these higher frequency measures of, of volatility or, or transitions. Next slide. So we're using um, three panels of the SIP, the 2014 and the 2018 and 2019. The sample are adults, ages 25 to 65. Uh, we use only self-reported or proxy interviews. Um, and for now, we're gonna we're using the SIP, what I call imputed measure of earnings, the TP earn variable. Um, I'm gonna uh, the I Robert Moffat, Emily Weemers, and I have some other work that measures volatility in the SIP at the annual level using older panels. And what we found in that work is that it doesn't matter what measure of earnings you use. It doesn't matter if you add up your earnings yourself or you use these the SIP calculated earnings. What matters is whether you use people who are entirely imputed or not. So what we do here is get rid of people who are entirely imputed. I guess that's big type Z imputations. Um, and then use imputed earnings as a first pass. That just makes our lives a lot simpler because we don't have to go through each individual component of earnings and consider individual imputations for each component, right? Um, TP earn. The SIP imputed earnings winds up with a with a, a relatively large number of people who have very tiny earnings. This is difficult to handle in measures of volatility. So we trim the earnings distribution at the bottom 1% to get rid of those very, very tiny earnings, and at the top 1% to get rid of people who might have been top coded. Um, and we do this even when we include zeros. So when we include periods of zero earnings, we are still removing from the earnings distribution the bottom and top 1% of the positive earnings distribution. And again, that's because these tiny earnings make measures of volatility um, difficult to interpret. And then on top of that, we exclude anybody with negative earnings. Next slide. Okay, so volatility. Um, volatility is the variance of percent changes in earnings. Uh, here we measure percent changes using the arc percent change. Um, the arc percent change has a couple of key benefits when you, in the context of volatility. 
Um, the first is that it's bounded between negative two and two or negative 200 and 200, uh, which reduces the impact of outlier earnings changes on the level of volatility. And the second is that it allows you to include periods of zero earnings as long as it's zero in only one or the other period, but not both, right? Um, and then we're going to look at volatility separately by job transitions or separations as the jolts data calls it and we're going to, we consider any job separation whether it is to employment or to non-employment whether it is voluntary or involuntary anybody who changes a job is considered a separation um and we call any separation between last period and this period, that separation is called as is labeled as happening in this period. Um, I, it, it is, you know, every time I, I, I've used the SIP a lot, every time I use the SIP, I'm not entirely confident that I've done it correctly. <laughs> I'm relatively certain that we have separations here coded asymmetrically, which is not quite right in this context, but it is what it is for now. And that is that we, we have correctly captured people leaving jobs, but we have not correctly captured people who enter from non-employment to a job. So we have job to job changes. We have job to no job changes, but I don't think we quite correctly have no job to job changes, just as a, as a caveat. Next slide. Okay, so if you do this at the monthly level, um, this is what you get. Something largely uninterpretable. Um, each one of those spikes is uh, seen by us, right? So every 12 months, you get a giant change in earnings. Um, and so what you wind up with is a, is a pattern where Earnings changes between months one and eleven of a year are much smaller than they than they should be, um, or at least where we think that they should be. And then you get this spike between month eleven and month twelve, between month twelve and month one, um, that is way 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 too big, right? So we cannot um, use this, um, and it doesn't matter. This isn't just about spikes that might be happening in job transitions. This isn't a, simply about people claiming that they're starting a job in the wrong month because we see it whether or not somebody had zero earnings or whether this is somebody without zero. So in panel B, if you are without a zero, that means you are continuous, you are effectively continuously employed, right? And we still get this really big spike in volatility. The spike, um, so. We can't do this. So this idea of high frequency volatility, um, this is out. Uh, so we came up with a compromise. Next slide. So the, the compromise is to aggregate uh, up to the annual level. So we're going to sum earnings at the year. We're going to return to annual volatility and we are going to, and over a period of time, we're going to count the number of transitions that somebody has. And that, that's our compromise. So this is just to show that actually, to the extent that we've calculated transitions correctly, at least in the, in the 2014 panel, the SIP does a very good job of estimating the total number of transitions, at least compared to the jolts data, which is the, probably the best number, uh, estimate of separations that we have. Something happens when we change into the overlapping panels in, in 2018, but I, and that could be my mistake, I don't know. Um, so we're getting the correct total number of transitions that happens in a year. We know from other work that, an, that the annual earnings distribution in the SIP is pretty good. And so we can be reasonably confident that when we aggregate up to the annual level, that we're we're getting estimates that that match in, in level in a level sense that match with what we think they should look like. 
And so we think that that means that we can use these annual numbers and then just separate into groups um, based on those annual numbers and sort of back out the effect of transitions, even if we can't get this high frequency measure of volatility that, that we wanted. Next slide. So um, when you do that, what you get is this. So the left panel is the average number of separations that happens over a two-year period because volatility is now measured over a two-year period by race. Um, and we see that um, black people have the highest average number of separations or roughly speaking, the likelihood that they transition from one job to another or that they have a job separation is higher um, and that their level of volatility is the highest. It, and the level of volatility is the highest, both for people who have a period of zero earnings, um, the red bar, or for people who do not have a period of zero earnings, the, the blue bar. So volatility is, is the highest for, for black people. They have the most transitions. Um, this suggests that transitions play a role in the level of volatility, which is sort of not surprising, right? Next slide. Okay, so the next question then is, is this about the effect of transitions per se, or is it about the, the number of transitions? And a simple way of doing that is to just separate by race and the number of transitions. So here we, we separate into four groups, people who don't have a transition, um, people who have one, two, or three or more. And again, we do this separately for people who have a period of zero earnings in a year versus people who, who don't, right? Um, so in both panels, the, the penalty for having a, a job separation is larger for non-white people than it is for, for white people, right? So transitions, sep job separations have a different impact on the instability, short run instability and in earnings for, for non-white people basically, right? Um, it is the biggest for, for black people. And especially when we think about people who remain employed um, in, in one form or another, but are having transitions that the penalty of having that job separation, as we see in panel B, is the, the biggest um, for, for black people. And one thing I, I wanna highlight that I forgot to put in the slides um, is that right now we're pooling men and women together. And, and that's actually kind of a no-no, like we shouldn't have done that. Um, because the, the trends and levels in volatility over this time period for men and women are different. Um, and it's also possible that, that the role that job separations play is different for men and women. The issue is that a job separation is a relatively low probability event. Um, in, in any given year, only about 2% of people will, will transition, will have a job separation, right? So once you separate that by race and gender in a, even a relatively large sample, like the SIP generates a lot of really tiny cells. And so we're still working on kind of how to, how to deal with that. Um, so yeah, next slide. Um, so, so that's, that's where we're at. We were hoping it to be farther along, but um, the SIP is what it is at this point. So this is what we think we know. So volatility is the highest for black people in the SIP, though we know this already from the CPS and from the, uh, yeah, I guess from the CPS. Um, unfortunately, monthly volatility is, is impossible to interpret, which I think is probably in some sense the most important thing that we found so far because it suggests that even if the cross-sectional distributions at the monthly level in the redesigned SIP are informative, what you would like to be able to use the SIP for are transitions because it's a panel data set. And it, there seems to be, at least in terms of, of uh, 
earnings changes and job changes, there seems to be this, this really big seam bias effect, right? That all of this is getting loaded on right think changes right at the calendar year. And the aggregate levels might be right. Like once we sum over the year, they might be they might be right, but they're not distributed properly um, over the year. And the evidence that we have for that is that levels that we in separations that we see at the annual level in the SIP are are pretty similar to the jolt. So that changes in this overlapping panels thing, but that again, that could be a coding mistake. I don't know. Um, and if we have faith in these estimates, um, separations seem to raise volatility more for black people um, than others. And um, black people also have more job separations. And, and we think that this is important in the sense that it, it is starting to tie two literatures together that haven't really spoken to each other um, in the past. But uh, we don't have any confidence intervals um, and we need some of those. And so I don't know if these level changes are actually statistically different from from, e from each other, though they are uh, empirically meaningful. Uh, thank you. Jonathan, you're on mute. Yes, I am on you. Okay, well, I was just saying thank you, Michael. And up next, um, we put back to uh, uh, read mode. Uh, we have Jiang Li from uh, Boston College presenting um, his work. So uh, feel free to take it away. Right now, I think I'm wrong. I can't be right. Yeah. yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Great, great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank, you, thank you so much for your invitation. I mean, it's my great honor to be here to present my work, Bank Competition and, and my and Entrepreneurial Gap. I'm a finance PG student from Boston College. So next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. So next slide. Sorry. Yeah. So the motivation that entrepreneurship is very important because it can boost economic growth by driving job creation and innovation. This wide benefit, there's the huge gender and racial gaps uh, in entrepreneurship. Uh, so if we look at the following figures, we can see uh, women made up 47% of total labor force. However, 20% of business owners with employees, they are female. If we look at their contribution to employment, these gender and racial gaps are even wider. Uh, female entrepreneurs, they only create 8% of total jobs. So ideally, if we can reduce the gender and racial gaps uh, in entrepreneurship, maybe we can drive economic growth and uh, uh, reduce inequality. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in order to reduce entrepreneurial gaps, we need to understand what are the causes of entrepreneurial gaps. Uh, lots of papers find that financial frictions may cause entrepreneurial gaps. So, for example, the most important factor that determines the success of minority-owned firms is the lack of startup capital. So, what kind of startup capital do entrepreneurial firms use? Rob and Robinson, they investigate the capital structure of entrepreneurial firms, and they find that entrepreneurial firms rely heavily on bank loans instead of equity financing. Um, so, given the importance of access to bank loans, uh, lots of papers find that minorities and women, they are disadvantaged groups in the lending market, even control for their credit worthiness. Uh, so they will face high rejection rates, higher borrowing costs because of discrimination. So how to solve this problem? Here's one potential solution. Becker's discrimination theory predicts that competition may reduce discrimination in the labor market. So if we apply his theory to the financial market, uh, next slide, please. Here's my research question. Can bank competition narrow entrepreneurial gaps by reducing discrimination in the lending market? Uh, the answer is not obvious. On the one hand, the answer is yes. Competition may increase the cost of discrimination um, because banks may lose customers if they discriminate against female and minority entrepreneurs. This, these discriminated groups, uh, they can easily uh, shop around, so uh, discriminatory banks may uh, lose customers and market share. On the other hand, the answer is not necessarily yes uh, because competition may move banks away from relationship-based lending which is well suited to overcome asymmetric information problems. And we know female and minority entrepreneurs, they suffer a lot from this asymmetric information problem uh, in the lending market. 
So to solve this problem, we face two challenges. The first challenge is that we need a direct measure of discrimination free of omitted variable problems. Uh, the second challenge is that we need some exogenous shocks to financial market competition. So how to solve these two challenges? I have two solutions. As for the first one, I use the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau complaint dataset. This dataset is the largest and official dataset covering millions of complaints from consumers uh, in the lending market. Um, and I build a direct match of discrimination from the narrative information in complaints against the banks using text analysis. As for the second challenge, I take advantage of the staggered industry deregulation law changes and build a state level bank deregulation index following rights and straw hat. Specifically, I will use the following two acts. The first one is the IBBEA, uh, the second one is Dr. Frank. I will talk about these two acts later in detail. So, the next slide, please. So let me preview my main result. My result can be divided into two parts. The first part is about bank outcomes. I find that deregulation can reduce gaps in the quantity and the quality of banking services in the in the following uh, uh, in the following aspects. Uh, as for quantity of banking services and financial inclusion, I find that before deregulation, minority communities they are not served by banks. They have lower branch density. However, after deregulation, the branch density in minority communities increases a lot. And this increase of branch density will translate into financial inclusion of minority uh, borrowers. So it means after deregulation, minority borrowers they are more likely to open bank accounts in these newly established branches. As for quality of banking services, I find that before deregulation, minority communities they receive low quality of banking services measured by the total number of complaints filed to the CFPB. So they will have a higher number of complaints filed to the CFPB. However, after deregulation, the quality of banking services in minority communities improves a lot because of intensified competition. Uh, and for the third part, discrimination, I develop a new measure of discrimination using text analysis by analyzing the narrative information in compliance filed with CFPB. And I find that uh, deregulation will reduce the complaints about discrimination because of intensified competition. Uh, thank you. Next slide. So let's move to the second part of my main result. Uh, it's about entrepreneurship outcomes. Uh, I find that deregulation can reduce uh, entrepreneurial gaps in the following three aspects. Uh, the first one is about business formation. I find that in fully deregulated states, the gender and the racial gaps can be reduced by 40% and 70% respectively. Um, uh, the underlying reason might be uh, the reduced gaps in access to startup capital. I find that minority and female entrepreneurs can raise more skewed business debt and home equity loans after deregulation. And also probably owing to the equal access to startup capital, the gaps in business performance are reduced by bank deregulation. Uh, so how to measure uh, business performance? I use uh, the profit, employment, and uh, I also find that um, after deregulation, minority and female entrepreneurs, they can get more uh, business equities. Thank you. Next slide. So here are related literature and my paper's contribution. The first strand of literature is about how to reduce gender and racial gaps in entrepreneurship. As for gender gap, lots of papers find that gender stereotypes of venture capitalists, uh, equal inheritance rights, and reproductive rights may impact the gender gap in entrepreneurship. So my paper's contribution is that it is the first paper shows that access to bank loans can reduce, can reduce both gender and racial gaps. Uh, recall that in the motivation part, Rob and Robinson, they find that um, Entrepreneurial firms rely heavily on bank loans instead of equity financing. So it's really important to understand the role of bank loans in entrepreneurship. Uh, the second strand of literature is about how to measure and reduce discrimination. So lots of papers that use racial gaps in rejection rates in interest rates as an indirect measure of discrimination. However, the weakness is that this method may suffer from omitted variable problems like discount points. So my paper's contribution is that it is the first paper that builds a direct measure of discrimination from narrative information in complaints against banks using text analysis and show that competition can reduce discrimination complaints. And this method may have several applications. So first of all, it might be helpful uh, to detect lending discrimination uh, for CFPB. And uh, this text analysis might be useful to, in other settings to detect discrimination against consumers, employees. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so I will talk about uh, the data set, the data set I use in my paper. Next slide, thank you. 
Uh, because of time limitation, I will briefly talk about the SIPB data set I use in my paper to investigate uh, entrepreneurship outcomes. So this data set is, long, is comprehensive, so it includes lots of information like demographic characteristics, entrepreneurial firms characteristics, and financing conditions. It is also longitudinal, so it will attract around 30,000 uh, individuals for around three years. So from this longitudinal data set, I can see the transition from non-entrepreneurs to, to, to entrepreneurs. Uh, finally, I, I use 11 panels and I focus on people at their prime age. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And then I want to talk about how to build bank to regulation index. Uh, I will allow two acts to capture the staggered uh, bank to regulation changes. The first one is IBBA. Uh, so following the passage, banks outside the state, they are allowed they are allowed to open branches across the line without permission. However, uh, states they are still allowed to use still allowed to use both provisions contained in IBBA to restrict or, in, or increase the cost of the out-of-state entry. So how to measure bank deregulation index? It is equal to four minus the total number of barrels, foreign rice, and straw hands. Uh, so this table shows you how to measure it. So for example, if we look at the, the following four provisions, if we look at the second provision, uh, state permission of the novel industry branching. If a state does not allow the novel industry branching, then I will subtract one from the index because uh, there will be one more uh, barrel. So if you look at this uh, index, it ranging from zero to four. Four means fully deregulated. There is no barrel, so it's very easy to enter the local market. It's a very competitive financial market. And zero means it's fully regulated, so it's very hard to enter the local market. This market is uh, not so competitive. So next slide, please. Then I want to talk about the second act, the Dollar Frank Act. Uh, this act is a one-time shock. Uh, it is effective uh, in uh, 2010. So, so, so it allows out-of-state banks to establish the Nova branches into any other states as if they were chattered in that state. The timing is similar to this because it's mainly driven by the Great Recession. And it is a nationwide act, so it might be under control of the state government and exogenous to the local economic conditions and entrepreneurial financing need. It will impact the state differently, so it will only affect states that do not allow the over industry branching before the act. So how to measure its impact? So I will add one to the deregulation index if a state does not allow the over industry branching before the act because it will impact the second provision shown in the last slide. Uh, so, this, uh, so, so this provision is removed, so I will add one to the index. Next slide, thank you. This figure shows you the involvement of the total number of interstate, uh, interstate uh, branches and non-interstate branches. The blue bar is the non-interstate branches and the red bar is the interstate branches. If we look at the first year of bank regulation, 1994, so we can see uh, the total number of interstate branches uh, increases from nearly zero to more than half of total branches uh, from uh, the beginning year of bank regulation and uh, recent, to, to recent year. Uh, because of bank deregulation. And it also shows that bank deregulation will lead to a more competitive financial market based on the uh, previous literature. Thank you, next slide. Uh, next slide, yeah. Uh, I will show you my first result, it's it about bank outcomes. These two figures shows you that minority communities, they are served by banks. Uh, so left figure shows you there is a negative correlation between the total number of uh, bank branches per 10,000 inhabitants and minority ratio. Uh, the right figure shows you that there is a positive correlation between minority ratio and the total number of mortgage-related complaints at a typical level. So it means the leverage figure shows you that minority communities have a lower branch, uh, lower quantity of branch coverage at a county level. Uh, so they'll have a lower uh, quality, quantity of banking services. The right figure shows you that minority communities have more mortgage-related complaints at a zip code level, so it means their quality is lower in these minority communities. Yeah, next slide, please. Now I want to show you that after deregulation, bank competition can improve the uh, quantity and the quality of banking services in minority communities. Uh, as for quantity of banking services and financial inclusion, I use two variables. Uh, the first one is the log of branch density at a county level. Uh, the second one is, uh, is the dummy variable equal to one if an individual I opens a bank account after a bank deregulation at an individual level using SIPB dataset. Uh, and for quality of banking services, I use the total number of complaints filed with the CFPB at the zip code level. Uh, and for 
independent variables, I use two independent variables. The first one is the interaction term between bank regulation index and minority uh, community dummy. Minority community dummy is a dummy variable equal to one if a, if a community is located at the top quarter of the distribution in terms of minority ratio. The second one is the minority uh, individual dummy and the, the interaction term between two regulation index and minority individual dummy. Um, because if I use the uh, individual level data set, I use this uh, individual dummy. Um, you recall that uh, deregulation index is ranging from zero to four. So four means fully deregulated, so it's very competitive. Zero means uh, fully regulated, it's not so competitive. So if we look at the coefficient, we can see uh, one unit increase in bank deregulation uh, in minority communities will lead to a three a three percent increase in the branch density in the branch density coverage and a one percent increase in the in the probability of opening a bank account. Uh, if we look at a column two, if we look at a column three, we can see a one unit increase in bank deregulation uh, will lead to a five percent decrease in complaints uh, in minority communities. So it means uh, bank competition can improve the quantity and the quality of banking services in minority communities. Next slide, thank you. Then I want to show you an example of a complaint about discrimination. So this example shows you that this complaint received in 2021 is about mortgage and uh, it's it against uh, BOA, uh, Bank of America. And uh, BOA's response to consumer is that it is closed with monetary relief. So it might be the fault of BOA instead of the fault of the consumer. Uh, so the consumer's complaint uh, narrative information is the following. If we look at, let's look at the first paragraph. Uh, I believe I'm being discriminated against because I disclosed my race at blah, 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 uh, uh, of the blah, blah, loan application. This information is erased because of confidential, re confidential reasons. Uh, then if we look at a second paragraph, quick summary of my background. I have excellent credit. My credit score is over blah, blah, blah. So how to measure discrimination complaint if narrative information includes the following words, discrimination, unfair, inequity, prejudice, injustice, or the related words, I will count this complaint as a discrimination complaint. So how to, how to validate this complaint uh, measurement? I will, I, I will show that to minority, they will have a higher uh, rejection rates and high interest rates in banks with higher uh, with higher volume of uh, discrimination complaint. So next slide, please. Thank you. Then I want to show you the effect of bank deregulation on discrimination. I use two variables. The first one is the dummy variable of, of discrimination complaint. The second one is the total number of complaints about discrimination at the zip code level. Both are at the zip code level. Uh, again, I use the interaction term between deregulation index and minority community dummy. I use a lot of fixed effect to control for local economic conditions. Uh, so I want to show you that the coefficients are negatively significant. It, it indicates that a one unit increase in bank deregulation in minority communities will lead to a 4% decrease in the probability of the instance of discrimination complaints and a 3% decrease in the volume of discrimination complaints. A result may be driven by the incumbent banks. So it means after the entry of, of, of out-of-state banks, the incumbent banks, the local banks, their discrimination level uh, is reduced. Uh, next slide, please. Then I want to show you the second part, the effect of bank deregulation on entrepreneurial gaps. So I, I use two categories. The first one is business formation. The second one is business funding. And for business formation, I use a dummy variable equal to one if a, if a woman or minority transitions from non-entrepreneurs to entrepreneurs within three years after bank deregulation. Um, as for business funding, I use a log of skewed business debt and a log of uh, mortgage debt at the at a entrepreneur level. So. As before, I use the interaction terms between uh, deregulation index by minority dummy, interaction terms between uh, deregulation index by woman dummy at an individual level or at an entrepreneur level. It depends on uh, which category. Uh, so I find that after deregulation, minority and uh, women are more likely to be entrepreneurs because of reduced discrimination. And also, uh, after deregulation, minority and female entrepreneurs, they are more likely to get more access to secured business out and mortgage out compared with their um, compared with white and uh, uh, white and male entrepreneurs. So I also have some additional results. I find that bank competition will reduce the gaps uh, in business performance and business equity, and also reduce the gaps in access to PPP loans. These loans are fully guaranteed by the uh, US government, so, so it, it is risk-free. So you can rule out the alternative hypothesis, and my results are driven by the default risk of minority and female entrepreneurs. And I also want to show you that these results are stronger in areas with high discrimination and stronger in industries that rely heavily on external financing. Yeah, next slide, thank you. Right. Try to wrap up in the next minute or so. Yes. 
Uh, next slide, yeah, thank you. So let me conclude. So in this paper, I used two important bank deregulation act to analyze the effect of access to finance on entrepreneurial gaps. I find the following results. Uh, bank competition can reduce gender and racial gaps in entrepreneurship uh, in the following aspects. And the underlying channel is that bank competition can improve the quantity and the quality of banking services and reduce discrimination. So at for policy implications, my paper underscores a need for policy intervention aimed at financial inclusion for female and minority entrepreneurs in the entrepreneurial finance market. And my method might be useful in detect, uh, in, to detect and disclose discrimination. And it might be useful to reduce discriminatory treatment in the financial market. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm thank looking forward to uh, Louis' comments. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So up next, we have Professor Chanek Zhou from Chinese University of Hong Kong presenting um, his work. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Chanek Zhou from Chinese University of Hong Kong Finance Department. This is a joint work with Jen Yugao, my colleague and PhD student, Sing Sin Lam. So in this paper, uh, we are asking uh, whether climate change matters for household portfolio choices. Next, please. So, um, yeah, we know that climate risk is, um, yeah, something that we should care about. Uh, it's well known. It matters for institutional investors' portfolio choices. And there are three forms of climate risks that, um, yeah, researchers uh, care about. Physical risk, a transitional risk, and regulatory risk. So, while um, physical and traditional risks have been widely studied, uh, there is a... Uh, um, yeah, less attention to regulatory risk, especially for household side. Um, but the literature, um, um, yeah, pays more attention. And then now there is a general consensus that this regulatory risk has, has already uh, materialized. So we are asking this question. Do climate change matters uh, for household through this regulatory risk channel? Uh, and if this is the case, uh, why do we observe this uh, link between climate change regulatory risk and household portfolio choices? Next. So, yeah, hypothesis of this paper is that uh, climate change would matter through this regulatory risk for households who work for high emission industries because the literature um, found that climate change regulations affect businesses, especially in high emission industries, through various channels. For example, um, it becomes harder for firms in high emission industries to grow their business, and they're also their profitability has been affected, and they also experience decrease in sales due to the customers' awareness. Um, now, many customers are uh, become aware of climate change. They want to be very responsible for their consumption. So through these channels, the firms in high emission industries may experience a negative shock after climate change regulations. And for employees who work for high emission industries would face elevated income risk. Next. And we know that Income risk is important for household portfolio choices. For example, if you are exposed to some kind of a background risk, such as labor income risk, optimally, you are supposed to reduce your overall financial risk exposure. And given that, our hypothesis is that climate change regulatory risk can lead to elevated income risk, especially households who work for high emission industry that will reduce the uh, reduction in their overall risk financial exposure. Next. So to test our hypothesis, uh, what we do is we re rely on the SIP data where we can observe household holding and where they live. Uh, also importantly, the industry of occupations. We also exploit these regulatory shocks, state level climate change action plans, as well as change in EPA stringency. And finally, we also look at climate change related natural disasters because 
those natural disasters can lead to a more stringent climate change regulation going forward. Our research design is going to be a triple difference setting because uh, within the same states um, which experiences uh, this regulatory shock, we only we compare household who work for high emission industries versus um, household who work for non high emission industries. So good thing about this triple difference setting is that we can fully control for statewide time variation by including state year month fixed effect. So then we don't have to worry about state GDP or state level, either economic or political environments. Next. So to give you the overview of our findings, we find that indeed the climate change action plans uh, leads to the decrease in the share of risk asset by 50%. Uh, and also the stringency measure matters for the share of risk asset by 4%. We also find that the impact of climate change, uh, sorry, uh, climate change related to natural disasters, uh, but you see uh, the smaller magnitudes, um, which is reasonable given that uh, natural disasters matters through the future regulation. So it, it is about uh, more about expectation about future regulation. Okay, so we conducted a, um, a few possible tasks to rule out that our results are superior. So for example, when we look at the entire states, instead of a household who work, work for high emission industries, that we don't see any impact on the entire states, which makes sense because if you work for uh, non-high em emission industries, uh, we cannot imagine that your labor income risk is also elevated, right? And we also look at the data labor income level. We do not find any changes to the labor income level, which is supports that our findings are more uh, likely to come from the second moment effect instead of the first moment effect. And these um, uh, environmentalists and scientists um, uh, yeah, classify climate change related disasters versus climate change unrelated disasters. And if we look at climate change unrelated disaster, there's no impact on portfolio choices. And in our heterogeneous analysis, we find that this effect is stronger for low income and low wealth household who are more concerned about their labor income risk compared to other households. Next. So, how um, is our paper related to the literature? So there is a literature uh, that looks at climate change in the context of household finance. So uh, mostly these papers are about physical risk and also um, there's no paper that looks at a portfolio with climate change regulatory risk. And also there are finance papers that look at climate change regulatory risk. Uh, however, it's mostly the firm side or institutional investors, not for household. Next. And our paper is also related to uh, this literature on uninsurable labor income risk because the economic channel that explains the relationship between climate change and household portfolio choice is this labor income risk channel. So we document a novel source of income risk that affects the household portfolio choices. Next. So the paper uh, that is the closest to ours is the Ilhan 2022 working paper. So like us, he looks at climate change and its impact on household portfolio choices. Uh, especially he looks at sea level risk, uh, not other uh, regulatory, um, uh, the sea level risk together with the climate change action plans uh, through these home ownership channels. So his idea is that if you are homeowners and your homes are exposed to sea level rise, then because of this uh, increase, the background risk, which is a sea level rising risk, you have to lower your portfolio choices. However, now the, the state governments come in and they adopt these climate change action plans that, that address this sea level risk that homeowners perceive less background risk 
assuming that you trust the state government and they're doing something and they increased their portfolio holding and stock exposure. So our finding is uh, uh, interestingly related to his paper because we find opposite relationship, um, not to homeowners, just, but just for a general household who work for high emission industry. So we find opposite relationships through diff different channels, but there is an interesting implication for wealth inequality. So if you think about homeowners, they are generally wealthy household, uh, but then the household who reduce their financial risk exposure in our sample are the poor people. Because uh, if you look at uh, demographic of the people who work for high emission industries, they are like uh, construction workers or who work for agriculture. So they're not necessarily uh, well-educated people and high income or high wealth individuals. So these climate change action plans makes uh, these uh, poor people reduce their risk exposure while it helps homeowners increase their risk exposure. Next. So in terms of the data, we use this SIP data. So uh, um, our samples start from 1984 to 2019. So climate change action plan uh, started uh, like from 2000. So for that, um, exogenous shocks, we do not use uh, from 1984, but we have a natural disaster data as well as EPA that start from 1970 something. So we fully use the data from 1984 for those two, um, yeah, exogenous shocks. Next. Yeah, so for climate change action plans, so Georgetown, um, yeah, university nicely collected uh, all the climate change action plans. So we rely on the Georgetown University data. And for EPA, we follow the literature and we measure stringency uh, of EPA for each state. Next. And for the natural disasters, we rely on the Seychelles data. And IPCC classifies um, climate change uh, related disasters. Um, so um, yeah, IPCC and then some papers. So following that, we classify earthquakes, tornado, volcano, winter weathers are as a non-climate change related disasters. And we uh, also rely on IPCC data to classify climate change, I mean, high emission industries. So we uh, merge this data with SIPP industry classification uh, that is based on census. And we find, we identify high em household who work for high emission industries. Next. So this is a basic summary statistics and if you look at the last two columns we compare households who work for high emission industries versus the non-high emission industries you can see um, uh, for high emission industry you are more likely to see a less educated white male with a low wealth level next so this is our basic specification for climate change action plan. So left hand side, we have a two measures of a financial risk exposure. One is the fraction of wealth invest in the risk asset. So that's, it is to capture intensive margin. So we also have a dummy variable that takes one. If you are a stockholder, otherwise a zero, that is to capture extensive margin. And on the right hand side, we have, a um, uh, plan dummy variable, which is a DID term. However, this is a triple different setting. So what we do is within the states that is affected by this adoption of a climate change action plan, we look at households who work for high emission industries versus uh, others. Okay. And importantly, given our triple different setting, we can have this uh, steadier month fixed effect. Uh, which is denoted by Psi ST. 
then we can fully control for statewide time fixed effect. And our setting is actually quite stringent because we also add industry times year month fixed effect, which means we also capture uh, occupation industry wide time variation. Next. And this is a specification for EPA stringency. Next. And finally, natural disasters. Uh, and for natural disaster, we also interact with other um, shocks like action plan and stringency um, to see any uh, whether there is any interaction together with a natural disaster. Next. This is going to be uh, the outline of the result. Next. So the first thing that we look at is the impact of the climate change action plans. So as you can see, our triple difference uh, dummy uh, variable is significantly negative, meaning that households who work for high emission industries reduce their uh, percentage of risk asset in their total wealth. However, we do not see significant impact on participation. Next. And this is the dynamic effects of climate change action plan. So we see there is a sort of an immediate impact on the percentage of a risky asset. Uh, however, for participation, it is only a significant uh, after five years, five years after the, the adoption. Next. And we also look at the labor income level. We do not see any impact so that provides suggestive evidence that our result is uh, likely driven by the second moment effect instead of the first moment effect. Next. And this is a result for EPA stringency. Uh, we can see a consistent result uh, with the adoption of a climate change action plan because uh, we do see a uh, negative significant impact on the percentage of a risk asset. However, for participation, we have a consistent sign but uh, it's not significant. Next. So here we interact with, uh, we interact stringency measure with uh, action plan and we see uh, when there is an action plan and the, the impact of stringency is uh, stronger. Next. Uh, next, please. So, uh, yeah, for the sake of time, um, yeah, I will just uh, skip this. And this is a result for climate change uh, related disasters. And uh, we see the similar result, but in this case, it's also significant for participation. Next. And for placebo test, um, if we repeat the test using climate change unrelated disaster, we do not see any impact. Next. And we also uh, interact with climate change related disasters with either action plan or EPA stringency, and we see the significant uh, negative sign, uh, meaning that the impact of action plan or stringency is stronger when there is a climate change related natural disasters at the same time. Next. So finally, we look at the heterogeneous effect. Um, now it's a quadruple difference setting because we interact a triple difference dummy variable with household characteristics. And we construct two variables, uh, low income. Um, I mean, we construct uh, many variables, but we see the result is stronger for low income, low wealth household. Next. Same uh, for other, yeah, shocks. Next. So to conclude, we find that the climate change regulatory risks matter for household portfolio choices, and our result seems to be consistent with the idea that this result is uh, driven by elevated income risk. And uh, important implication of our finding is that um, climate change action plan must be uh, well executed in a way that some poor income household um, do not reduce their financial risk exposure because it matters for 
uh, wealth inequality at the societal level. So that's all I have today. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So next we have our discussants uh, portion. Let me uh, open up the PowerPoints and um, discussants if you're able to save like a minute or two off and keep it to five minutes if possible. So we can have some a little bit more time for questions. Uh, that'd be appreciative, but I understand. Um, so let me first. Open, let me share, share content again, Microsoft PowerPoints, share. All right, now here we have Rob's here. <laughs> we'll be discussing the first paper. Um, hi, I'm Rob. I'll be discussing uh, Christina's paper. Uh, next slide, please. Just a, a standard disclaimer, uh, any opinions here are mine and not censuses. So just a brief overview of the paper, it examines the household's recovery from income shocks using a structural model. Um, the second point is actually a little correct. It uses the, both the 2008 and the 2004 SIP panels. Um, and a nice key feature of the paper is it recognizes that there's a measurement error of household income. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of main contributions, it examines income recovery without relying on a particular event, which is um, uh, probably the most common approach used in literature, so it, it, it's not tied to, or maybe gives results that are a little more generalizable. Um, it recognizes and attempts to correct for income uh, measurement error, um, examine uh, shocks on any impacts, shocks on the inequality, and then impacts of the shocks by important subgroups. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of feedback, I have uh, three things I wanted to discuss. First is uh, the effect of sample selection. Um, so for sample selection, you see um, there's a number of like reasonable uh, conditions that are imposed that are common to the labor literature, for example, excluding the self-employed. I do wonder if those could potentially be relaxed a bit since self-employment is a common uh, type of employment for people who lose a job. Um, for example, during the 2008 recession, uh, necessity self-employment, which is people who lost a job and then went into self-employment increased. But more importantly, I wanted to look at um, uh, the dropping of uh, individuals that weren't observed in all periods. That's the biggest number of households that were dropped. And my concern is that that could create some selection in terms of income. For example, if, you know, the selection of unobservables uh, that, that, that could lead to, say, like higher income or something and, and potentially bias the model. So just maybe some discussion in the paper around that. Um, next slide, please. In terms of the measurement error correction, um, I'll caveat this as saying it's it's been a while since I've read many structural papers, so please take this with a grain of salt. But observed income is equal to true income in period for individual I in period T, and measurement error the plus measurement error. And the measurement error is composed of a time invariant and a time varying component. Um, as far as I understand, the test can't reject the null hypothesis that um, measurement error is classical and homoscedastic, but I do worry that there's still some potential concern um, uh, for uh, time varying components of measurement error. For example, uh, there's particularly related to the survey. For example, you might imagine that someone who's single in one year that gets married in the next year is probably much more likely to have a proxy response, and that proxy response is likely correlated with, with measurement error. Um, and maybe similarly affects for imputation of income. Uh, next slide, please. And then lastly, just thinking through how to conceptualize recovery. Um, I like the, the setting of looking back, going back to original income, but um, original incomes can vary by subgroups. And one of the findings that surprised me was the difference between high school educated and college educated uh, workers, and particularly the high school educated workers recovered more quickly. And I sort of wonder if it's sort of like a levels effect. So if you had like a hypothetical example of, of two workers, one minimum wage worker earning 40 hour, working 40 hours a week and a software developer earning $100,000 a year, we might expect the minimum wage worker to recover more quickly because the, maybe the bar is a little lower for recovery. But along the way, there might be different meaningful levels of recovery, for example, like being in or out of poverty that 
that might be worth considering. And I don't have a specific recommendation, but in terms of thinking through what does it mean to recover, speed of recovery, the probability of recovery seem important, but maybe dollar amounts or maybe uh, getting past, say, poverty could be, could be relevant as well. Um, and that's, that's all I have. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you very much, Rob. And so up next we have uh, Neil presenting the second paper. Um, slideshow. Uh, and all right, feel free to take it. Yep. All right, thanks, Jonathan. Um, thanks, everyone. I'm Neil. Um, uh, I'm really excited to talk today about um, Michael Carr's paper and, and co-author's paper on short-term instability, race, and the role of job transitions in the SIP. Um, I do apologize if there's any background noise that my microphone picks up um, in this talk. Uh, so, um, next slide, please. Um, okay, so the racial wealth gap is very well documented. Um, this is, um, you know, this is a figure taken from the Treasury um, showing the gap in wealth by race over, um, you know, the last 30 years. And the thing is, is that, you know, if you don't know what your income looks like um, next month or what your income will look like next month and you have a safety net to fall back on, then that may mean that, you know, you eat out less. It might mean that you have to dip into savings in order to pay rent. Um, if you don't know what your income looks like next month and you don't have a safety net to fall back on, um, that could mean that you don't pay your utility bills or you face eviction. Um, and so understanding, you know, income instability, um, and understanding it, you know, by race is a, it's, it's a very important research question. Um, and so I think this paper is, you know, really, really important. Um, and so next, next slide, please. So the authors, you know, they, they start out by, by asking, you know, how does higher frequency earnings and stability vary by race? Um, and, you know, they want to look more specifically at what role do job transitions play in these differences. Um, and, you know, kind of broadly, these authors, you know, they find that earnings volatility is, is highest for black individuals, um, which, you know, is like Dr. Carr said, um, this is something that we've, you know, found in the SIP or in CPS and other data sets. Um, but these authors also find that separations appear to raise volatility more for individuals that are black um, relative to other groups. Um, and so next, next slide, please. So, so, you know, there are some strengths in this of this project, um, which is that, you know, they're asking a really, really important research question. Um, and these authors are taking really careful considerations on how to measure job transitions and earnings volatility in the SIP. Um, it's, you know, it's not very often that I come across like papers that use that work with SIP um, or, you know, data users have a good understanding of how to tease out uh, type Z interviews, right? Or, you know, how to tease out proxy interviews. Um, and so, so the fact that these authors are really thinking about that um, when working with data um, I think is a really big strength of this paper, um, especially with the data limitations and the data issues that they find. Um, so uh, next slide, Jonathan. Um, so, so I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna jump into like the nitty gritty of the variables that they use, um, mostly because I didn't have a paper to read, um, but um, I did kind of have some like general Kind of questions or considerations, um, you know, when when thinking about this this project, um, the first one that kind of came came to mind was, you know, so so Dr. Carr notes that we can't that you know that you know we can't really use the the monthly um, change in in earnings volatility, but I am wondering if you know even if things are aggregated to the annual level, I am wondering if you could still um, leverage the monthly information that the SIP provides. 
and that is by you know make, making some sort of measures of job tenure. Um, you know, if you think about an individual who separates from a job um, within a year, and they've held that job for a year, they may be treated very, very differently from an individual who has held a job for six months within a year, and they only have one separation. So I think job tenure uh, would be, you know, an interesting thing to look at. Um, within the slides, these authors note that they do not separate voluntary and involuntary separations. But I do think separating that out um, would be really, really interesting to look at. Um, and then the last thing that I was curious about is how are these results changing uh, when we when we consider regional variation? Um, you know, you might not have this the power to do a state level analysis, but you you could possibly aggregate based off of census regions. Um, and another thought that I had was, you know, the possibility of aggregating by state policies that particularly impact. Um, the employment outcomes of individuals that are um, non-white. Um, so, you know, one example could be ban the box policies. Um, so, with that, thank you everyone for your time. And yeah. Thank you uh, very much. So, next we will have L Lewis uh, discussing the third paper. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so, I'm Louis Boren. I'm going to be discussing Ashan's paper today. Um, it's a really well written paper, and it was a really enjoyable read. Um, I'll just go ahead and say that all all views are my own and not those of the Census Bureau. Uh, next slide, Jonathan. Um, and so, just just kind of as an overview, um, you know, interstate banking deregulation um, marked a major shift uh, in how banks could operate in the U.S. And so, this paper is going to ask a few important questions. Um, about kind of how that affected um, quality and quantity of banking services offered to minority uh, borrowers uh, and, and how that kind of reduced entrepreneurial gaps. And so it, and it's going to provide kind of this interesting finding um, that deregulation kind of worked in this regard. Um, it increased quality and quantity uh, and, and reduced gaps. And, and so really interesting paper. Um, next slide. So kind of think about comments for this. Um, as I mentioned before, it's it's really well written. It's really thoughtful. It's it's got a lot in there. It's it's a really good read, um, but it, but it's got a lot of data, and and so there's a lot of really cool things to look at with this. It's using almost 30 years of SIP data. Um, it has FDIC data on bank branches. Um, it's got CFPB data on consumer complaints, um, and it, and it expands on Johnson and Rice results from by adding in 2005 to 2021. Um, Laws for for interstate ba um, branch bank banking, and so um, really really cool paper. Um, provide and it provides a lot of interesting results. And so um, next slide. Um, so a couple of thoughts with this. You know, as I mentioned, there's 30, about thirty years of SIP data, and um, the economy changed a lot over those thirty years, as did SIP. Um, and so kind of the way that SIP captures financial data, and particularly bank account ownership, changed a lot over those periods. And so um, Jonathan's, um, John Chaika, I think, started started kind of the series of talking about SIP versus the survey of consumer finances and kind of SIP kind of struggling more when we got to the 96 panel, when it was when the 96 panel came into play um, compared to earlier SIP panels and really didn't get fixed until Jonathan uh, with, with some of his, his colleagues, uh, Mark Lee and um, Mike Gideon, did a lot of work to actually come in and fix this starting with the 2014 panel. And so you know, I, I think that's something I, I've also looked at with, with my co-author, John Greenberg. Um, but I think some of this, I mean, thinking about kind of how much the data changed over time with SIP, I think a little more discussion just to see if this kind of is affecting the results or not. It might or it might not. But I think I, I think a paragraph, I, I think a paragraph or two about that would would, would add a lot of value. Um, second, you know, I, I think the paper does a really nice job of kind of thinking about differences kind of between um, white and black, um, and just kind of some of the differences that we see in that regard. Um, but, but I was curious, I think, you know, how, how much would, you know, if we consider kind of Hispanic origin, how much would this affect the magnitude of the results? And so, you know, just kind of thinking about how census often presents data where, where census will show a number where we might show like white, non-Hispanic, we might show white. Uh, if we were looking at poverty rates in 2021, um, for both male and female, um, the white poverty rate was 10%. Um, White non-Hispanic was 
And that's coming because Hispanic had a 17.1%. Um, Hispanic any race had a 17.1% poverty rate. And so I think just a few tables maybe showing how much this affects the results. I, I think that that also could add a lot of value. Um, you know, but just those are kind of my two main thoughts on this. Um, next slide. And then my, my third thought on this and kind of final thought is going to be that the textual analysis is really interesting, and these kind of analyses are becoming more important in data science and economics. And so I, I think just kind of thinking about, you know, if if you sampled 100 or 500 of these cases from the, from the CFPB complaint data, um, you know, how many type 1 or type 2 errors would you see off of the classification? I, I think something like that would be really helpful. And I think also talking about, and maybe this is a separate paper, but talking about, you know, what really worked and what didn't, like what words would you have expected would have worked? And maybe they, they led to more type 1 or type 2 error than you would have thought. Um, just so kind of other researchers can build on that. I think that might be a really interesting either data appendix or even a second paper on this. Um, just so people can really, you know, take um, utilize these results. And so um, really interesting paper, really fun read and uh, just yeah, thank you for that. Thank you very much, Lewis. Um, uh, so last we have Brianna Sullivan here uh, talking about the fourth paper. Yes. Hello, I will be discussing climate change and household risk taking. Next slide. So the broad objective of this paper is to assess how climate risks affect household investment decisions. Existing literature has documented that climate change can pose risks to high emissions industry through climate risk regulations. And much research has already been devoted to assessing how climate risks and regulations affect institutional investors' portfolio decisions. However, less well known is how households respond. And so this paper works to fill the gaps by evaluating how household investment behavior is affected by climate regulatory risks. Next slide. So the authors combine SIP data with data on adoptions of climate action plans, EPA enforcement, and natural disasters to provide a comprehensive, well-supported description of how households reduce their investments in risky assets in response to increasing climate regulatory risk. I really appreciated that this paper worked hard to understand the mechanism through which households respond. Its argument is that higher regulatory risks are not directly contributing to reduced labor income. Instead, they can increase um, perceived labor income risks among employees and affected industries, and to mitigate that income risk, households then reduce the value of their assets held in stocks and mutual funds. Next slide. So one of my first questions is, how are households in high emission industries defined in this paper? Asset values are aggregated to the household level, and regression controls include demographic characteristics of the household reference person. Um, but, you know, is employment in household in high emission industries defined as a, you know, whether any household member was employed in the industry or be only the household reference person in the industry? Um, if it's the latter, I worry that the treatment effect is underestimated because the control group may then still include households affected by regulations. So adding this clarification to the paper, I think would be really helpful to readers. Next slide. And then my next question is about the finding that adoptions of action plans do not lead to lower labor income. So the paper presents evidence that some employers or some employees in high emission industries respond to increased regulatory risk by switching to non high emission industries. And because there is industry switching, I was curious whether the composition of workers at the industry level are changing in a non random way following the adoptions. And the reason I ask is because this would have implications for whether households are affected by both a direct income shock and an increase in perceived labor income risk. So for example, if we assume no changes to person level income, if individuals that switch to non high emission industries were relatively low income, you would expect average income among high emission industries to increase following the adoption of action plans. But because the paper's results point to a lack of change in labor income, that would actually suggest that labor income fell for workers that remained in high emissions industry, and that would point to a direct income shock. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then my next question is, in these figures, we see a substantive change in the diff and diff coefficient five years or more after the adoption action plans. And I was curious as why we think this is happening. 
is it, you know, does it take at least five years for the policy recommendations in these action plans to be implemented such that although the adoption um, may have an immediate but small effect on the outcomes of interest, it isn't until the recommendations are implemented um, five years plus that there's a larger impact on um, stock market participation and investment and risky assets. So I think it could be helpful if the paper dug a little bit deeper into this. And then next slide. Um, just in the interest of time, I'll skip to the second bullet point since that was a question that kept um, arising was I was curious, you know, about where how so we see that households are taking money out of risky assets and I want to know where are they are shifting their resources to. So are they moving it to checking and savings accounts or CDs and bonds? So although this is more of an accounting exercise, I think it really highlights a strength of SIPS wealth data. So um, I really enjoyed reading this paper and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you uh, everybody. All right, so I think we have some time for a Q&A. So I think the procedure, let's take questions from the audience uh, first and then if there's time we can talk amongst the panelists and presenters. So I think, um, Greg, I think the procedure is you will raise your hand and Greg uh, will unmute you and you'll ask your question. So um, just give a minute or two to see if anybody has questions. Thanks, Jonathan. And if people are having trouble finding the, uh, the WebEx hand, um, I imagine you could put in the chat that you would like to uh, come off of mute and ask a question. So you no one has question may ask one question to my discussion. I mean Oh sure, yeah, you can respond. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um first of all I would, oh so you you have a question maybe you can ask it first if, if you want. I noticed that Chris Christian oh, mine is for my discussion too, so you can go ahead. Okay, 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 no problem. So so should I respond first or yeah, why don't you respond first? first and then we'll see if there's any audience uh, more audience questions. Okay. okay, 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 no problem. Yeah. So so I for the uh Lewis uh comments, I really appreciate his comments. I I mean it helps me a lot, but but I don't know for some comments I don't know how to solve the problem. So so I guess because of time limitation, he doesn't have enough time to elaborate on maybe because may I'm I'm not so familiar with the data set. So may I ask how to I mean, could you please give me more instructions about how to solve the bank account ownership uh problem across time? So you mean that maybe see uh underestimate the bank account ownership. So do you have any comments or suggestions about how to solve this problem? I mean, you mentioned that uh, we be, maybe we can talk a, a little bit about it in, in the paper, but I'm not so sure whether I get your point or not. Yeah, sorry for that. Yeah, so I mean, John, Jonathan's gonna work on this too, but, but I think like, you know, one of the considerations was when the 96 SIP came about, mm -hmm. you know, I think and that's like five years into your data. Yes. You know, you could see a spike up in SIP uh -huh. rates. So, so, so fewer people were reporting owning bank accounts. Yes, and that was noticed. John Chiger wrote a paper about it. Um, yes, but the, one of the things was is it just it looks like a divergence where it just was the, the SIP instrument wasn't doing as good a job of capturing bank account ownership. And so, uh -huh. I, I think it's really specific to the research that you're doing. Uh -huh. in terms of, uh -huh. You know, just seeing how much of those years, like you see a big. Uh -huh. Up loss um, at 96 that, that persists all the way through the 2008 panel. So that didn't get redesigned until 2014 panel. And in 20 by 2014, rates look pretty consistent among the SCF, the SIP, and the FDIC banking supplement. Um, I see. Largely consistent today. Um, but but they weren't for a while with SIP kind of under accounting for bank account ownership. And so I just I think that could be something just to take a look at, particularly around 96. Uh -huh. A big change in your results. I think that's how I approach that. I see. So I can just focus on the 96 panel and to check whether my results are robust or not, right? Yeah, kind of through through 08. And I'm happy to discuss that with you more. You know, we can we, we follow up on that. Yeah, yeah, we can follow up on. Yeah, we can provide more uh, details. But yeah, I think Lewis summarized it uh, fairly well. Yeah, so thanks. Thank you. Uh, Greg, did we have any questions for the chat or did we not? 
So I'm seeing a couple hands up in the uh, panelist list. Um, I haven't seen anybody mention that they want to come off mute. All and, right. Uh, uh, sure. All right. Let's. Well, I'll, I'll go to the panel. So how about uh, Christina? I see. Uh, at least I see your hand. So uh, feel free to ask your question. Mm -hmm. I had a question for the main discussion. What did you mean about proxy responses and how would I see those in the data to see if I'm if my data is affected by those? Um, so a proxy response is um, when, so say like within my household, an interview shows up, they ask me my income, I give it, and then I give the income of my wife. Um, within the SIP data, there's um, that's output. There's a variable that indicates proxy response. Off the top of my head, I don't remember it, but I can follow up with you about that online. Um, in terms of testing for it, I'm I'm not sure. I guess, um, but just off the top of my head, I'm not sure. But I, it's just sort of my concern is just that over time there could be like changes, either like specific to the survey that could have like time varying changes even like having imputed income or not. Um, and, th and that could be associated with measurement error. Um, but like, I'm also like hesitant because I'm not, if I'm honest, like I'm not sure as like a, a non-structural person, I understand the test well enough to say like, oh, like this is a concern because they might rule it out and it might be not an issue, but that's, 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 I mean, those are, those are the things that came to my mind, and I can follow up with you maybe later about like how to like uh, obtain those variables. Yeah. Yeah, and quickly, Christina. Yeah, it's like SIP's unique in that it tries to get individual interviews from everyone in the household. So it was just like you answer a bunch of SIP questions, and like, oh, is your roommate home? And then they're like, oh, my roommate's not home. Oh, can you answer on behalf? You might imagine like when you ask about your roommate's income that or. You, you people would just have like you know more wild guesses. So yeah, that's sort of like the gist of the proxy question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I I'll use the last two minutes that I have now. First of all, Christina, I put into the chat the um, variable name. Um, that'll tell you how to identify proxy respondents. Um, it's actually a, in the 2004 and 2008 panels. It's a really important variable that's um, often ignored. Mm -hmm. um, so my question um, is for Mike. Um, so uh, I have like a, a question and then a request and the i mean i might i might have to just do the question at this point because the request is would take like way more time than we have um <laughs> have you are or are you aware of anyone who's calculated um monthly earnings volatility in the pre-redesigned sip oh. so, okay i i've gotten a few questions from um, some macroeconomists like um, Muscarini sent me one, and maybe there was one other paper. So I know people have been calculating it, and my impression was that seam bias wasn't nearly so bad. Um, so maybe this is an instance, and it, it's worth checking in the data, but maybe this is an instance of um, the, you know, change in the in the questionnaire resulting in seam bias, which I, I know yeah, I that's, have to, that's have what I was thinking. I mean, so but, I mean, Moscarini, they and somebody else whose name I'm blanking on, they have a paper that looks at monthly job transitions mm -hmm. in the earlier panels of the SIP, and you don't see the seam bias problems there um, that you see in the the later panels. Mm -hmm. um, so I would guess that carries over to, to earnings too, but I haven't I haven't done it. Okay. So the request, I mean, I know I know that we're gonna meet coming up. Um, but the, the request is like way, way more kind of like joint brainstorming. So that's maybe like with yeah. zero minutes left in the session is not the right time to do that. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would. I'm. I, it's on the list of of things to do. Um. Yeah. The old the old SIP had it certainly had its seam bias, and you know, Marquis and Moore showed you know the the wave and the on on seam transitions and the not on seam transitions really were very dramatically different very much like what you're seeing. The only difference is with the rotation groups in the old SIP, they were, there was always only a quarter of the sample had that seam transition at one in one month pair. And now we've given everybody the same seam. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. I mean, you could attempt to benchmark, I guess, against short panels in the CPS. Um, for example, but I mean, I it, the, yeah, the seam bias is definitely there. It just sort of smooths itself in in a way that it doesn't in the the new one. I guess maybe is the problem. Yeah, right. And that's part of some of our our redesign discussions. And like Mark said, some brainstorming about what might be the best way to deal with these measurement issues that are causing researchers the biggest anxiety. All right. Um, Jonathan, well, one, one more thing, Mike, I yeah, did sure. want to thank you very much for the very, very careful uh, look into the SIP details. And that's one of the things we really like to get out of the, mm -hmm. these types of things. Um, you know, nobody at census would, would sit there and tell you that, you know, SIP is perfect and, you know, without, without its complications. So, um, we're really glad, as Neil said in her comments, that you know you you as a researcher, and I know you've done a lot of work with SSB and SIP along the way. Um, have you know? It, it's really great to have careful people looking at the data, and then you know, giving us input on things to you know pay attention to and and work on in the future. Yeah. So I really appreciate that uh, hearing that come from you and, and I've heard it in a couple other sessions. Um, so uh, thank you. And the, thank you, Neil, for the comments, you know, that was right on. All right, cool. Well, if we have no other um, burning questions, I want to thank everyone for the time. I want to thank presenters, exciting to see so much SIP work from a variety of uh, PhD students uh, to like professors. Like it's great to see you know a variety of people using and then also presenting our data. So thank you very much for your time. Um, and I guess that is it. All right, everybody, have a good evening. Um, thank you. <laughs>